Thomas Feedback in Manchester. Um, so I'm just going to read a few poems from Strange Husbandry. Um, and I think I'm going to open with uh, Which Just Means. Which is after the execution of Giles Corey, who was um, an English colonialist accused of witchcraft in Salem, uh, 1692. Of course, he was innocent. Um, but he was pressed to death by boulders, which doesn't sound very enjoyable. <laughs> um, say I was a swallowtail, Apertura iris, or Inicus isle, or any live specimen, because really, what does it matter? And you, a scientist with your pins, instead of inquisitor with your boulders. Cold metal points struck through like pikes to the board beneath. As you stroke and stroke my pinned wings, bands glittering in black and gold, in my fine dusted ochre, pain is no object. And once pinned, you whisper to me of my own frail beauty and how despite the pain and the pinning, you love me really, and how the Lord will set me free. But even now, even like this, pain blind, froth mouthed, seizing, there is no stopping this. How you love me more, pinned down, how you love me still. Inside, lamps are lit white bright. At the windows, moths gather, Wings shush glass, unknowing their small night shadows brush these beautiful brutalities. Mullioned eyes, seeing only lightness, wonder, white glittered flame, flinging themselves, sick and ecstatic as saints. There is no getting up from this. So let us pretend I am wingless and sightless. So if I am wingless and sightless, it means I become nothing more and nothing less. Which means I become nothing and everything. Witches means I become all the night's dark spaces and set myself to fly out in a hush of wing-brushed night and take my leave of that small voice, wingless and sightless, gasping out more weight, more weight. Yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> um, it's going to get worse, don't worry. <laughs> and so the next poem is called Bucha, um, which maybe for an Irish person on the surface might seem like an odd choice, but one of my best friends growing up um, is from Ukraine, and we had a lot of discussions about whether or not he should go back. Um, the opinion obviously was no, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, and we think Obviously, in Ireland, we support Ukraine, obviously. Um, but it, it was a lot of conversations that we had, and obviously it's on the news, it's kind of inescapable. Um, just kind of seemed... I'm not a particularly political poet, but it just seemed like something that I sort of couldn't ignore writing about. Um, so, Bucha. You have to remember, at some point, someone was taking butter out of a butter dish when the windows blew out. <coughs> and perhaps it was fine china. Then, suddenly, it was bricks. Smoke, fire, human bone. And then a child or dog screaming. It became rubble. It became 23-year-olds wielding Kalishnikovs. It became necessary. You Google. How do you make the perfect Molotov cocktail? Shaken, lit, but not stirred. It became a tank, rolling over a civilian's car, and children pulled close to burning from a missile hot building. And running, scattering along a street under gunfire to what? Mass graves stuck by Russians. It became bunkers and lone dogs barking, and all of us watching screen by screen. There are bodies splayed on streets where they ran, though no one comes to claim them. Smoke bombing itself into sky, resembling a tree line where once upon a time trees used to be. And now there is no real end to this poem. Um, and I should 
probably read the title poem. I feel like that's maybe a thing. Um, so, Strange Husbandry. Your phone is a mystery, an abyss on whose surface one name in particular swims up from the depths of your darkness like some gaping, terrible fish, drifting into your inbox night after night, glittering your darks like a masochist, mouth glistening for the upturned curve of the sharpened tip, the hook, the hook, the hook. How intimate was he? Was it biblical? A serial thing? Or a name-only spit-in-the-face pump-fuck affair? The sweet lip rip and come in me room, the bounce, the bounce, the bounce. The still fresh memory of his groan and glisten in the hot August night last summer. I can't understand it. I've killed all my lovers, tasted the dripping iniquity of my exes, old bones I have licked and discarded. Why do you keep him? It is such strange husbandry. Poor animal, leashed and breathless, begging for lashing for the smack on skin, the sex scent of leather, his last best ass tickler. In the deep breath of evening, I hear him buzzing, blue bottle fly, fetid, and pestering over your insta, sticky feelers, inking his own dark void in a frenzy, dying for a sweetness, for a skin on skin look of you, heart eyes on your stories, on post after post. But let's be honest, it is cruel letting him keep at it like this. I say we back him, blind kitten, Runt. It is futile. Let there be no idols before me, for I am the love, your dog. I am a mouthful of such sweet God, your holy confirmation of holes. Unlike him, I see only you and you, sole idol for whose presence the waves I shear and part. O oh, Exodus, how slow, how steady, you tear <coughs> apart the last fine strings the gut belly wrench to the sweet red ripped centre, to the last wet heart love you will enter, enter, enter. <sighs> okay, a little bit easier for the last one. Um, so, just a note about this one, it's called The Descent from the Cross. I'm not necessarily religious. Um, but this is quite an interesting painting. It was painted by Rembrandt, or what is commonly kind of assumed to be actually a student of Rembrandt, not actually Rembrandt himself. Um, apparently there are clues in the makeup of the painting that that's what academia seems to say it is. Um, but this painting is very interesting for a reason. Um, because what, ostensibly, if you just look at it, it's Christ on the cross. Right? So it's, he's being taken down, it's not really that interesting. But when you actually read about like the makeup of the painting and how it was constructed. In the Western world, our eyes read from left to right. And it's a very interesting painting because you would assume that Christ would be the focal structure of the painting. But actually, the thing that really intrigues me is the character on the lowest left-hand side of the painting. She's dressed in red. Everybody else in the painting is painted as if some sort of fake construction of what I guess Rembrandt or whoever it was decided that's what people in 1AD looked like. And she's interesting though because she's dressed entirely in contemporary clothing for the time, which is 1634. Um, it's intriguing because for a modern person at the time to look at that painting, it would have kind of been like putting a punk rocker into a Renaissance painting, so it's a bit odd, would have been a bit shocking. And it kind of tells the viewer that she is the main character in the painting. Um, so I kind of took the emotive side of Mary Magdalene and just kind of went with that one. Um, so, The Descent from the Cross. One. Night falls over Golgotha. Under a blood moon we work by lit lamps, the hills still quiet. Except for the hum of women, a low weeping and the men at work over a body, the soul left. I, Magdalena, stone silent, lay the shroud that shall hold the body. I take the veil from my hair and cover his. Two. What holds the body, if not hands? 
What do hands do with tenderness when the body refuses to hold it? What should I do with these hands, these wounds of God, but hold them? Does it matter if they know they are implements, divine or otherwise? Three. The gates of Jerusalem, flower in darkness, our small band hastening on with its cart, the soldiers at the gate full silent, we flank the body, veiled in fine cloth. I walk with the first rank of women into the city. Even at this hour, there are crowds. Beneath my hand, through the thin white linen, I feel his hair. Though it has been days, death has not limpened it. I feel the softness of his curls still. Four. Nicodemus brought vats of myrrh and aloe, befitting a king, paid, he said, of his own pocket. The women work washing the body of grime, of dust from the hill. We work at wiping death from the body. I tend to the small mercy, the wound in his side. I cannot take my eyes from the face as though it were sleeping. I cannot find the sufferance my eyes have seen. I cannot find pain as when the voice cried out and then was gone. In the ninth hour on that ghastly hill, that voice, the voice that quieted my needle working on the shroud, that raised my eyes and brought my hand to still. Five. The knocking so astounded, and the servant who brought him ashen to the house of Joseph, the same centurion. I must speak my mind. My hand, it acted out of mercy. I ask forgiveness. Nicodemus took the fine wrapped gift. We unwrap the cloth, the spearhead, and the blood still partly wet. Our eyes, in low light, glanced amongst ourselves and glistened. Six. What is left to be said of the empty tomb, or the rock before my eyes rolled back, or off the hill where wind alone ate breaths out of the dying brood? We sail on quiet water, the sailors about their work, they do not know me or don't say. I veil my hair. Even the children are quieted. All is memory, impartial, unclear. But I have scented my wrists with aloe and with mirror. Seven. The red moon whitened. Here the horizon breaks its yoke, dripping a dawn flush morning after morning. The sea is a shroud and I glisten. Our roaming days crack the world open, oar by oar. I have braided a lock of your hair into mine. The veil shifts in the wind. My fingers find a thread of you tied to me still. O oh Galilee, my Galilee, it will be night there now. Your hair threaded to mine. I will take you, beloved. I will carry you. I will carry you to the end of the world.